Section three of Letters of Pliny by Pliny the Younger, translated by William Melmoth, revised by F. C. T. Bosanquet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrew Coleman. Letters fifteen to twenty one. Letter fifteen to Paternus. As I rely very much upon the soundness of your judgment so i do upon the goodness of your eyes not because i think your discernment very great for i don't want to make you conceited but because i think it as good as mine which it must be confessed is saying a great deal joking apart i like the look of the slaves which were purchased for me on your recommendation very well all i further care about is that they be honest and for this I must depend upon their characters more than their countenances. Farewell. Letter 16. To Catilius Severus. I am at present, and have been a considerable time, detained in Rome, under the most stunning apprehensions. Titus Aristo, whom I have a singular admiration and affection for, is fallen into a long and obstinate illness which troubles me virtue knowledge and good sense shine out with so superior a lustre in this excellent man that learning herself and every valuable endowment seem involved in the danger of his single person how consummate his knowledge both in the political and civil laws of his country how thoroughly conversant is he in every branch of history or antiquity in a word there is nothing you might wish to know which he could not teach you as for me whenever i would acquaint myself with any abstruse point i go to him as my storehouse what an engaging sincerity what dignity in his conversation how chastened and becoming is his caution though he conceives at once every point in debate yet he is as slow to decide as he is quick to apprehend calmly and deliberately sifting and weighing every opposite reason that is offered and tracing it with the most judicious penetration from its source through all its remotest consequences his diet is frugal his dress plain and whenever i enter his chamber and view him reclined upon his couch i consider the scene before me as a true image of ancient simplicity to which his illustrious mind reflects the noblest ornament he places no part of his happiness in ostentation but in the secret approbation of his conscience seeking the reward of his virtue not in the clamorous applauses of the world, but in the silent satisfaction which results from having acted well. In short, you will not easily find his equal, even among our philosophers by outward profession. No, he does not frequent the gymnasia or porticoes, nor does he amuse his own and others' leisure with endless controversies but busies himself in the scenes of civil and active life. Many has he assisted with his interest, still more with his advice, and withal in the practice of temperance, piety, justice and fortitude he has no superior. You would be astonished, were you there to see, at the patience with which he bears his illness, how he holds out against pain endures thirst and quietly submits to this raging fever and to the pressure of those clothes which are laid upon him to promote perspiration he lately called me and a few more of his particular friends to his bedside requesting us to ask his physicians what turn they apprehended his distemper would take that if they pronounced it incurable he might voluntarily put an end to his life. But if there were hopes of a recovery, 
how tedious and difficult soever it might prove, he would calmly wait the event for so much, he thought, was due to the tears and entreaties of his wife and daughter, and to the affectionate intercession of his friends, as not voluntarily to abandon our hopes, if they were not entirely desperate. A true hero's resolution this, in my estimation, and worthy the highest applause. Instances are frequent in the world of rushing into the arms of death without reflection and by a sort of blind impulse but deliberately to weigh the reasons for life or death and to be determined in our choice as either side of the scale prevails shows a great mind we have had the satisfaction to receive the opinion of his physicians in his favour May heaven favour their promises, and relieve me at length from this painful anxiety. Once easy in my mind, I shall go back to my favourite Laurentum, or, in other words, to my books, my papers, and studious leisure. Just now, so much of my time and thoughts are taken up in attendance upon my friend, and anxiety for him, that I have neither leisure nor inclination for any reading or writing whatever. Thus you have my fears, my wishes, and my after-plans. Write me in return, but in a gayer strain, an account not only of what you are and have been doing, but of what you intend doing too. It will be a very sensible consolation to me in this disturbance of mind to be assured that yours is easy. Farewell. Letter 17. To Viconius Romanus. Rome has not for many years beheld a more magnificent and memorable spectacle than was lately exhibited in the public funeral of that great, illustrious, and no less fortunate man, Virginius Rufus. He lived thirty years after he had reached the zenith of his fame. He read poems composed in his honour, he read histories of his achievements, and was himself witness of his fame among posterity he was thrice raised to the dignity of consul that he might at least be the highest of subjects who had refused to be the first of princes as he escaped the resentment of those emperors to whom his virtues had given umbrage and even rendered him odious and ended his days when this best of princes, this friend of mankind, was in quiet possession of the empire. It seems as if providence had purposely preserved him to these times, that he might receive the honour of a public funeral. He reached his eighty-fourth year, in full tranquillity and universally revered, having enjoyed strong health during his lifetime with the exception of a trembling in his hands, which, however, gave him no pain. His last illness, indeed, was severe and tedious, but even that circumstance added to his reputation. As he was practising his voice with a view of returning his public acknowledgments to the emperor, who had promoted him to the consulship, a large volume he had taken into his hand, and which happened to be too heavy for so old a man to hold standing up, slid from his grasp. In hastily endeavouring to recover it, his foot slipped on the smooth pavement, and he fell down and broke his thigh-bone, which being clumsily set, his age as well being against him, did not properly unite again. The funeral obsequies paid to the memory of this great man, have done honour to the emperor, to the age, and to the bar. The consul Cornelius Tacitus pronounced his funeral oration, and thus his good fortune was crowned by the public applause of so eloquent an orator. He has departed from our midst, full of years indeed, and of glory, 
as illustrious by the honours he refused as by those he accepted. Yet still we shall miss him and lament him as the shining model of a past age. I, especially, shall feel his loss, for I not only admired him as a patriot, but loved him as a friend. We were of the same province, and of neighbouring towns, and our estates were also contiguous. Besides these accidental connections, he was left my guardian, and always treated me with a parent's affection. Whenever I offered myself as a candidate for any office in the state, he constantly supported me with his interest and although he had long since given up all such services to friends, he would kindly leave his retirement and come to give me his vote in person. On the day on which the priests nominate those they consider most worthy of the sacred office, he constantly proposed me, even in his last illness, apprehending the possibility of the Senate's appointing him one of the five commissioners for reducing the public expenses, he fixed upon me, young as I am, to bear his excuses, in preference to so many other friends, elderly men too, and of consular rank, and said to me, Had I a son of my own, I would entrust you with this matter. And so I cannot but lament his death, as though it were premature, and pour out my grief into your bosom if indeed one has any right to grieve, or to call it death at all, which to such a man terminates his mortality rather than ends his life. He lives, and will live on for ever, and his fame will extend and be more celebrated by posterity now that he is gone from our sight. I had much else to write to you, but my mind is full of this. I keep thinking of Virginius. I see him before me. I am for ever fondly, yet vividly imagining that I hear him, am speaking to him, embrace him. There are men amongst us, his fellow citizens perhaps, who may rival him in virtue, but not one that will ever approach him in glory. Farewell. Letter 18. To Nepos. The great fame of Isaias had already preceded him here, but we find him even more wonderful than we had heard. He possesses the utmost readiness, copiousness, and abundance of language. He always speaks extempore, and his lectures are as finished as though he had spent a long time over their written composition. His style is Greek, or rather the genuine Attic. His exordiums are terse, elegant, attractive, and occasionally impressive and majestic. He suggests several subjects for discussion, allows his audience their choice, sometimes to even name which side he shall take, rises, arranges himself, and begins. At once he has everything almost equally at command recondite meanings of things are suggested to you and words what words they are exquisitely chosen and polished these extempore speeches of his show the wideness of his reading and how much practice he has had in composition his preface is to the point his narrative lucid his summing up forcible his rhetorical ornament imposing in a word, he teaches, entertains, and affects you, and you are at a loss to decide which of the three he does best. His reflections are frequent, his syllogisms also are frequent, condensed and carefully finished, a result not easily attainable even with the pen. As for his memory, you would hardly believe what it is capable of. He repeats from a long way back what he has previously delivered extempore, without missing a single word. This marvellous faculty he has acquired by dint of great application and practice, 
for night and day he does nothing, hears nothing, says nothing else. He has passed his sixtieth year, and is still only a rhetorician, and I know no class of men more single-hearted, more genuine, more excellent than this class. We who have to go through the rough work of the bar and of real disputes unavoidably contract a certain unprincipled adroitness. The school, the lecture-room, the imaginary case, all this, on the other hand, is perfectly innocent and harmless and equally enjoyable especially to old people for what can be happier at that time of life than to enjoy what we found pleasantest in our young days i consider isaias then not only the most eloquent but the happiest of men and if you are not longing to make his acquaintance you must be made of stone and iron so if not upon my account or for any other reason come for the sake of hearing this man at least have you never read of a certain inhabitant of cadiz who was so impressed with the name and fame of livy that he came from the remotest corner of the earth on purpose to see him and his curiosity gratified went straight home again it is utter want of taste shows simple ignorance is almost an actual disgrace to a man not to set any high value upon a proficiency in so pleasing noble refining a science i have authors you will reply here in my own study just as eloquent true but then those authors you can read at any time while you cannot always get the opportunity of hearing eloquence. Besides, as the proverb says, the living voice is that which sways the soul. Yes, far more. For notwithstanding what one reads is more clearly understood than what one hears, yet the utterance, countenance, garb, eye and the very gestures of the speaker alike concur in fixing an impression upon the mind that is unless we disbelieve the truth of aeschines's statement who after he had read to the rhodians that celebrated speech of demosthenes upon their expressing their admiration of it is said to have added ah what would you have said could you have heard the wild beast himself and Aeschines, if we may take Demosthenes's word for it, was no mean elocutionist. Yet he could not but confess that the speech would have sounded far finer from the lips of its author. I am saying all this with a view to persuading you to hear Isaias, if even for the mere sake of being able to say you have heard him. Farewell. Letter 19. To Avitus. It would be a long story, and of no great importance, to tell you by what accident I found myself dining the other day with an individual with whom I am by no means intimate, and who, in his own opinion, does things in good style, and economically as well, but, according to mine, with meanness and extravagance combined. Some very elegant dishes were served up to himself and a few more of us, whilst those placed before the rest of the company consisted simply of cheap dishes and scraps. There were, in small bottles, three different kinds of wine, not that the guest might take their choice, but that they might not have any option in their power one kind being for himself and for us, another sort for his lesser friends, for it seems he has degrees of friends, and the third for his own freedmen and ours. My neighbour, reclining next to me, observing this, asked me if I approved the arrangement. Not at all, I told him. Pray then, he asked, 
What is your method upon such occasions? Mine, I returned, is to give all my visitors the same reception. For when I give an invitation, it is to entertain, not distinguish my company. I place every man upon my own level, whom I admit to my table. Not accepting even your freedmen? Not accepting even my freedmen, whom I consider on these occasions my guests, as much as any of the rest. He replied, This must cost you a great deal. Not in the least. How can that be? Simply because, although my freedmen don't drink the same wine as myself, yet I drink the same as they do. And no doubt about it. If a man is wise enough to moderate his appetite, he will not find it such a very expensive thing to share with all his visitors what he takes himself. Restrain it. Keep it in. If you wish to be a true economist, you will find temperance a far better way of saving than treating other people rudely can be. Why do I say all this? Why? For fear a young man of your high character and promise should be imposed upon by this immoderate luxury which prevails at some tables under the specious notion of frugality. Whenever any folly of this sort falls under my eye, I shall, just because I care for you, point it out to you as an example you ought to shun. Remember, then, nothing is more to be avoided than this modern alliance of luxury with meanness. Odious enough when existing separate and distinct, but still more hateful where you meet with them together. Farewell. Letter 20 to Macrinus. The Senate decreed yesterday, on the Emperor's motion, a triumphal statue to Vestricius Spurina, not as they would to many others, who never were in action, or saw a camp, or heard the sound of a trumpet, unless at a show, but as it would be decreed to those who have justly bought such a distinction with their blood, their exertions, and their deeds. Spurina forcibly restored the king of the Bructeri to his throne, and this by the noblest kind of victory, for he subdued that warlike people by the terror of the mere display of his preparation for the campaign. This is his reward as a hero, while, to console him for the loss of his son Cotius, who died during his absence upon that expedition, they also voted a statue to the youth, a very unusual honour for one so young, but the services of the father deserved that the pain of so severe a wound should be soothed by no common balm. Indeed, Cotius himself evinced such remarkable promise of the highest qualities, that it is but fitting his short limited term of life should be extended, as it were by this kind of immortality. He was so pure and blameless, so full of dignity, and commanded such respect, that he might have challenged in moral goodness much older men, with whom he now shares equal honours. Honours, if I am not mistaken, conferred not only to perpetuate the memory of the deceased youth, and in consolation to the surviving father, but for the sake of public example also. This will rouse and stimulate our young men to cultivate every worthy principle when they see such rewards bestowed upon one of their own years, provided he deserve them, at the same time that men of quality will be encouraged to beget children and to have the joy and satisfaction of leaving a worthy race behind if their children survive them, or of so glorious a consolation, should they survive their children. Looking at it in this light, then, I am glad, upon public grounds, that a statue is decreed Cotius, and for my own sake too, just as much, 
for I loved this most favoured, gifted youth, as ardently as I now grievously miss him amongst us, so that it will be a great satisfaction to me to be able to look at this figure from time to time as I pass by, contemplate it, stand underneath, and walk to and fro before it. For if having the pictures of the departed placed in our homes lighten sorrow, how much more those public representations of them, which are not only memorials of their air and countenance, but of their glory and honour besides. Farewell. Letter 21 to Pascus As I know you eagerly embrace every opportunity of obliging me, so there is no man whom I had rather be under an obligation to. I apply to you, therefore in preference to any one else, for a favour which I am extremely desirous of obtaining. You, who are commander-in-chief of a very considerable army, have many opportunities of exercising your generosity, and the length of time you have enjoyed that post must have enabled you to provide for all your own friends. I hope you will now turn your eyes upon some of mine, as indeed they are but a few your generous disposition i know would be better pleased if the number were greater but one or two will suffice my modest desires at present i will only mention Vaconius romanus his father was of great distinction among the roman knights and his father-in-law or i might more properly call him his second father for his affectionate treatment of Vaconius entitles him to that appellation, was still more conspicuous. His mother was one of the most considerable ladies of Upper Spain. You know what character the people of that province bear, and how remarkable they are for their strictness of their manners. As for himself, he lately held the post of Flamen. Now, from the time when we were first students together, I have felt very tenderly attached to him. We lived under the same roof, in town and country. We joked together. We shared each other's serious thoughts. For where, indeed, could I have found a truer friend or pleasanter companion than he? In his conversation, and even in his very voice and countenance, there is a rare sweetness as at the bar he displays talents of a high order, acuteness, elegance, ease and skill, and he writes such letters too that were you to read them you would imagine they had been dictated by the muses themselves. I have a very great affection for him, as he has for me. Even in the earlier part of our lives, I warmly embraced every opportunity of doing him all the good services which then lay in my power, as I have lately obtained for him from our most gracious prince, the privilege granted to those who have three children, a favour which, though Caesar very rarely bestows, and always with great caution, yet he conferred, at my request, in such a matter as to give it the air and grace of being his own choice. The best way of showing that I think he deserves the kindnesses he has already received from me is by increasing them, especially as he always accepts my services so gratefully as to deserve more. Thus I have shown you what manner of man Romanus is, how thoroughly I have proved his worth, and how much I love him. Let me entreat you to honour him with your patronage, in a way suitable to the generosity of your heart, and the eminence of your station. But above all, let him have your affection, for though you were to confer upon him the utmost you have in your power to bestow, you can give him nothing more valuable than your friendship, that you may see he is worthy of it, even to the closest degree of intimacy. I send you this brief sketch of his tastes, character, his whole life, in fact. I should continue my intercessions in his behalf, but that I know you prefer not being pressed, 
and I have already repeated them in every line of this letter. For, to show a good reason for what one asks, is true intercession, and of the most effectual kind. Farewell. End of section 3